Welcome to the second episode of the Wildwood podcast. Uh, today we're very lucky to have the Director of Zoological Operations, Mark Haben, with us. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Nathan. <laughs> um, I had to apologise to uh, Laura for holding this outside. Um, <laughs> like I said, it was my idea and my hands are a little bit cold now. Um, but yeah, um, thank you for taking the time out of your really busy schedule. Um, I think one of the things um, that people are always interested in is how you sort of got into this line of work. Like, how did, how did you start, um, you know? getting into to working at zoos okay well i guess like many people in in an animal based industries it's been a lifelong passion i've, I've mm. always wanted to work um, in and around wildlife uh, native species being a particular interest of mine and many many years ago too many to, to recall <laughs> i was offered the opportunity to work at uh, zsl london zoo um, that was initially part of the uh, animal training team. I'd always been interested in falconry, done a lot of flying of, uh, of birds myself in my youth and uh, was invited to, to um, head over and start uh, working on the display team there, which, which I did. Um, absolutely loved it. It hadn't been my intention to necessarily stay there yeah. uh, longer <laughs> term. And uh, one thing led to another, and then 22 years later, I, I was, uh, I was uh, managing the zoo, I, so I was a uh, zoological manager for London Zoo, um, and then head of uh, zoo operations for uh, London and Whipsnade zoos as well. So it's been a, been a long and very varied career working in a range of different capacities. Uh, throughout that period, at one point around about 2005, um, I was asked to go on a sabbatical to, to help run a project in Ecuador, which I went and did. Wow. Um, rainforest um, surveys in Ecuador and Amazon in uncharted areas, which was absolutely wow. amazing. Must be, you must have some incredible stories from that. Uh, well, I've, <laughs> I, I've, I've certainly got some, including a really interesting one around a vampire bat, but that's perhaps for another time. <laughs> okay, but, we'll keep, we'll keep but, going. Yeah, it was, but, but yeah, absolutely fascinating. And uh, I've been very lucky working in, in the zoological field for a very long time. I've worked with some absolutely outstanding individuals. Mm. Done, uh, been lucky enough to, to work with David Attenborough on a number of occasions wow. throughout my career. Incredible. Um, sitting in uh, I remember sitting in a tropical uh, Komodo dragon house with a Komodo dragon and David Attenborough <laughs> reading his script on Komodo dragons, which was... Uh, that must which, be a bit surreal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was. And of course, um, in any animal-related industry, you, you work with the most amazing people, in including these incredible teams of keepers. And I, I think yeah. I've worked with some of the best in the industry, not least here at Wildwood Trust yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it seems that like passion is at the absolute sort of core of that. And like you said, some people sort of go into this kind of field of work and then you know, 20, 30 years later, it seems to just grab people straight away. And it, it, it really does. And, you know, there, there's so many different elements to it. I remember when, when I first started working in zoos around 1999, um, the role of a zookeeper then was, it, it, it was very different to what it is now. So there's mm. a lot, you check the animals, you feed the animals, do a bit of cleaning. And of course, now things have advanced so much that everybody's a new, an animal nutritionist. The, the, the wow. teams look at the diets. We look at environmental parameters for every species we're working with. So mm. the team are uh, monitoring UV provision for reptiles, temperature control, water quality, um, as well as the diets. We're producing animal welfare audits and, and working a lot with academic bodies as well to ensure that everything that we're doing mm. is as best as it can be. And, yeah. uh, and it's, it's evolved a lot in, yeah, that's in that a, time. A, there must be a lot more sort of things you've got to look at and health and safety sort of things. I mean, oh, yeah. one of my first questions was, what is what is your day-to-day -day responsibilities as a zoological director? I mean, there must be vast, but... <laughs> it, it, it is, and day-to-day and -day here is ensuring that well, one, everyone's okay. The, yeah. the teams are all okay. The animals are okay. Um, responsible for all of the animal keepers, the project teams, the projects, um, uh, the education teams as well. So a lot, a lot of my days actually uh, are having meetings, mm -hmm. meeting people, checking the park as well. I think it's a really important part of, of a job like this is, is being visible and being yeah, out absolutely. on the ground, um, ensuring that all the animals are okay, the staff are okay, projects are progressing how they need to. Um, and keeping that keeping on track of projects as well because mm. obviously with um, so much that we want to achieve in any given time there's as any visitor to Wildwood regularly says 
things change here very quickly. Yeah. Everything's evolving. We're always looking to push something yeah, new. It's a really fast moving landscape. I mean, there's so many wins for 2023, which we'll obviously we'll probably talk about yeah. later and so much stuff coming up in 2024. In the first episode with Laura, we talked about all of the conservation projects that are going on. How do you ensure the, the well-being and the, and the health of the animals um, at Wildwood? Okay, so we have we have quite a complex system in place uh, where, we, where we run animal welfare audits. Mm -hmm. So okay. a lot of that work is, is in the monitoring of the animal. We, we, we evaluate what food each animal is taking, mm -hmm. how they're behaving, and we've got such a strong team here. Um, their observational expertise is, is phenomenal. So as soon as anything, or if anything came up, mm -hmm. the team are on it. So an awful lot of monitoring is, is the honest answer, is that, sure. that visible, that, that being present, being around the animals, um, all day, mm -hmm. um, yep. which certainly enables the team to pick up on anything at all that might give cause for concern. We're very good here. We're a native species park, so of course the environment that the animals are in is that natural environment that they should be in. Yeah, um, absolutely. But yeah, it's really around monitoring and that that presence. Yeah, and it's it's amazing the the sort of the bonds that the, the keepers have with some of some of the animals as well that they they do know that oh, he's having just a bit of an off day today i've kind of went around sometimes as you know sort of taken photographs and i'm sure dave butcher our resident photographer will say the same that sometimes people will say maybe don't pop over there at the moment because you know it's for, for x y and z you know they're not sort of feeling themselves today but they you just they just hone in instantly because they've got that bond with the with the animals which is it's absolutely absolutely right and um any of the behaviors the the the, the behaviours that the animals display are as recognisable as the individual physical appearance of the animal. Mm. So if anything's slightly off kilter, um, pregnancy is often quite quite a big one. Like yeah, some of the team of might come to you and say, I think the animal might be pregnant, she's eating more, she's, right. um, she's taking herself away off show. So it's not always um, that there's necessarily a concern, but it's, mm. it, there might be something very positive on the horizon that we Absolutely. look for as well. Oh, fantastic. So how do you balance the, the needs of, of, of the animals with kind of the, the education and, and engagement goals of Wildwood Trust? That must be a, a difficult balance to kind of... It, it is, and it's in, in much the same way that any commercial aspirations that we have in terms of events, anything like that, same as uh, uh, presenting educational talks, anything at all, there's, there's always a balance. Mm. And there's, to some extent, there has to be a, a degree of compromise because we want people to see our animals. Mm. Um, but it, it, it's not a difficult balance because the majority of events that we run, the people that want to come here, the members that, that, that support us so, so much, um, are all very much behind the animal welfare, the, um, the, the, the work that we're doing. And so we naturally find that a balance is created anyway. And we're mm. very sympathetic to any events that we put on. The educational elements around what we're doing, of course, we've got this fantastic education team, Absolutely. And keeper team that deliver all of these talks and presentations. And if, for example, there, there was a need not to, we mm. wouldn't do it at, at any point. So based Absolutely. on those observations. And have you seen a difference, obviously you've been working in the trade for a long time, have you, have you seen a difference in kind of the public's perception of, of going to animal parks and zoos? It's a good question. And I would certainly say yes, very much so in, in terms of what people expect. Now, when I first started in zoos, it was one, one of the common things that might come up as, as a concern or a, a complaint for visitors is, I haven't seen that animal. Why, yeah. why? And there was there was certainly an expectation very early on that mm. animals would be there at the forefront of an enclosure. They are there to be seen, yeah. and uh, if they're not seen, that is a concern. Wow. Of course, now wildlife, nature, natural history is far more accessible than it's ever been through our ability to travel to, mm. to wild places, um, but also through amazing documentaries. Everything's much more accessible. There's a much broader understanding now, I think, of wildlife, of nature, and actually zoos are, are held more to account than they ever were rather than absolutely rather than anyone expecting to see an animal straight away is is the habitat right mm -hmm. why is that animal not on show well it could be hiding in a really large exhibit it's it's doing what it wants to do mm -hmm. and providing animals choice is um i think far more acceptable now to, to the visiting public than perhaps it would have been and i think there's a difference of course uh, in between city zoos that might rely heavily on tourism mm -hmm. and, and tourists coming from countries where uh 
animals are expected to be seen more in, in of course yeah, yeah of course in a wildlife park like here in the middle of the countryside in this beautiful woodland environment i think there is an expectation mm. that actually you sometimes have to look for the animal yeah. and spend time doing so and one of the things i've really noticed is uh, with our members they get to come unlimited amount of times to wildwood uh, kent and also wildwood devon our, our, our other park in devon and to to be able to come at will whenever they want and see seasonal changes with the animals is you know i read a lot of comments on on social media that you know people will say oh the bears weren't here because they're, they're in torpor but they they understand educationally why they're you know they're in torpor and um it just seems that people especially our members are a lot more clued into animal behavior that's absolutely right and of course bears here for us we've, we've rescued um numerous bears mm. now we've 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 got three currently being held in devon we've got three here as well and of course everyone loves seeing the bears yeah absolutely but there is that real understanding that on welfare grounds we let the bears sleep mm. you know we, we get to the end of october you're not going to see them really mm. until the beginning of March when they wake up again. Now, not every collection allows their, their, their bears to go into torpor. It's the right thing to do. That's what we do. And people enjoy that. People accept it. They understand it. And, uh, and, and there's this huge excitement again, of course, around March time when they know they're going to be out playing, jumping in the ponds. And, and that yeah. in itself is a, is a wonderful thing to see. Even down to changes of coloration of some of the animals. You look at the Arctic foxes. They're, yeah. they're like wow. entirely different animals between <laughs> winter and, and, and summer. And, and people really enjoy seeing that because it's natural. That's mm. what they should be doing. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the bears coming out of Topper is going to be a fantastic um, sort oh, of... Exciting. Yeah, and I know that Bucky has been... Um, because obviously Bucky being being a cub, he's not went into. He's been a bit sleepy, but he's not went fully into talk. No, uh, no. But he's, uh, I think he's ready for his uh, for his friends to be back soon. And yeah. well, he is. Yeah, I mean that, that that was an amazing piece of work that, that the the bear team did here was that, that introduction with a young bear cub to two very mature adult male uh, big, brown big, bears. <laughs> big boys. Yeah, for sure. They're yeah, huge as well. and, but but that play and the interaction between them was oh. fantastic. And I think I think you're right in what you say is that Bucky's looking for them. The whole time yeah, yeah. wants them to wake up, but of course, yeah. uh, you know, patience is a virtue. Absolutely. I think <laughs> there's a little bit of movement at the moment and yeah, yeah, yeah really looking forward to, to, to that, that side of things as well. Um, in 2023 was a, was a massive year for Wildwood. Yeah, um, gosh, I wondered yeah. if you could sort of talk about some of the, um, maybe what we would class a, a win or like some of the positive moments in 2023 for, for oh, Wildwood. Fans, we've, we've had so many. In That's course. a long list. <laughs> it is, it is, it's always a long list. I'm really, mm. really proud to be able to say that. Um, the, the opening of the, the first ever Arctic Fox walkthrough enclosure, yeah. I think, was, was huge. Yeah. And what, what's been wonderful about that is, is the consistently high feedback that we've had from yeah. people walking through this incredible natural woodland mm. um, and seeing the arctic foxes interacting with their landscape it's been our most successful year for the breeding of red squirrels which yep. which was phenomenal you know we built the we completed the new breeding and on show facility mm -hmm. so that visitors can see the, the work that we're doing and see the red squirrels mm -hmm. when they come to the park and of course breeding so many mm -hmm. um as a, a real priority species for us has mm -hmm. been absolutely and wildwood have been doing that for a long time haven't they yeah, yeah. the red squirrels make up a large part of our history and again a, a very significant part of our future um, breeding them for release into sites in wales has been very successful and of course now being able to provide other, other um, interested parties with red squirrels to again continue that breeding success that that we see here through, mm. through the work of the team um, has been absolutely wonderful of course we've got this incredible pine martin development that, yeah. that was all but finished uh, at the end of last year that's that's uh, just coming to a close now i've got some slides to go up we've got a uh, <laughs> male pine martin to move in which is really exciting so yeah. um, again not far away from that um, and yeah, it's, it's just been a, a really it's, exciting yeah. year. Just been there's been so many things to talk. I mean, and d down in Devon, I mean, one of the f as, as I st started for Wildwood almost six months ago, one of the first things I got involved with was um, uh, sort of the rescue and, and the collaboration with Jimmy's Farm to save Diego, <laughs> and that was a, a fantastic story. You know? it's, it, 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 oh, it's incredible, and it's it's one of those stories that you you reflect back on saying, you know, we have done an incredible thing. We've yeah. done a really, really great thing for that animal. And, you know, Diego, his, his life was in very serious jeopardy. He had no options. There were no options for him. Mm. Jimmy's farm intervened and said, yeah, we'll, we'll take him, which was, was, was great life-saving work but of mm. course they didn't have an enclosure there yeah. was nothing ready for him um, at that point and so when they approached us and said would you please just help save this bear's life 
of course we're going to. Yeah. We, we, we've got to. That's yeah. You know, the, the the thought of losing an, an animal like that because of an accommodation issue is is uh, for us just inconceivable. There's a there's a long list of things we haven't mentioned there, but you know we'd be here for three hours talking through everything. So well, that's it. We were so many amazing things yeah. Uh, yeah absolutely you know I th I th even going down to the demonstrations that we put on uh, last year i think the best we've ever done with huge audiences the yeah. teams flying the birds here mm -hmm. um absolutely wonderful brilliant series of presentations that that we've done um the bison platform of course that was finished is is fantastic yeah. wow. viewing out over the whole of the bleen and yeah. of course the bull elk is, is paired up with caramel now which yeah, is yeah. the first time exciting so, you know, it's such an extensive list, and you never do everyone uh, full full credit and justice. But we've we've set up the the holiday club here that the education team yes. have run. Jamie and uh, the team there have done such a wonderful job with that. Oh, and Wildings is like so popular, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's yeah, really it's, and it's, the night tours and oh, they do so much. Yeah, yeah, brilliant, brilliant time, brilliant year. It really was. And um, 2024. <laughs> um, obviously, people are dying to know, um, you know, what what is planned for 2024. Obviously, there's there's so much um, yeah. there in the pipeline. Some things that you probably can't talk about, but you know, what what can you share and what sort of tidbits could you give us? Yeah. So we we always plan quite far in advance as to what it is that we want to be doing for this year. Of course, we've got. Um, Crumbs. Well, I, I guess the really big projects are going to be the Lynx development and mm. the uh, Wolf platform. Um, so we're already probably three quarters of the way through. Wow, this already? Yeah, wow. through through the link through the Wolf development. So we've nearly pretty much doubled the size of the European Wolf enclosure. That's incredible. Um, created a whole new space for them, as well as their old enclosure. They've got access to the new woodland uh, area, which which is. It's just brilliant. And then from April onwards, we're going to be starting to develop our Lynx facility. So right. um, we're, we're doing a huge Lynx, Lynx project um, for people to see these amazing charismatic animals. We've got two young Lynx here, which are, mm. are doing incredibly well, but we want to showcase them, give them a really large enclosure. Mm. And then to aid um, the visitor experience, we're going to create another woodland walkway um, up in between Lynx and Wolves. That wow. again is going to start around April time. Um, be open for the summer. That's what we're planning Fantastic. for. So, so for, uh, for the summer season, uh, visitors to Wildwood will have a brand new experience, being able to see wolves and, and lynx in an entirely new environment, which is very, very exciting. Um, we've got snowy owls arrived last year. Of course, Chinese water deer arrived last yeah. year. So uh, we're working on the enclosures for them throughout next year. Mm -hmm. So I can certainly talk about about that. The, the snowy owl enclosure will be taking place I'm imagining around about June time we'll be putting, okay. putting that up. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, turtle doves, farmland, bird aviary, chuff flight. Um, that's all underway now. The footings have been uh, made for that already. Brilliant. There are things that are happening. They are yeah, going yeah. ahead. Where, <laughs> in fact, all of those projects that I've spoke, spoken about then are underway. Wow. And then once we've got all of those things done, we're going to be looking at two or three really exciting projects, that, some of which will start this year. Others will probably be 2025. Brilliant, and stay tuned for those ones. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly. Absolutely. Um, and what's happening down in Devon? Obviously, we talked a lot about the Kent site. What's, what other things are happening down in Devon as well uh, currently? So we've got loads going on at Devon. As, as always, the crayfish project, which I'm sure Laura would have t spoken yeah, about, has, has taken off. That's been absolutely brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, we're, we're start, starting to plan for new species at, um, in, in our Devon park as well. So on top of the, the big move that we've got with Diego and the bears coming mm -hmm. out of Torpa, we're planning a new uh, hoofstock facility for reindeer in, in Devon. Reindeer? So, yeah. Amazing. Really charismatic species, really popular here. Yeah, especially and through, they were, great course. through Christmas, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Obviously so, all year round, reindeers are great all year they round. Are, they are, they are. A reindeer is not for Christmas. It's, yes, it's apologies. Year. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we, we're going to be developing the facility for that. And we're currently mm -hmm. looking at um, working with the Wildlife Trust on a uh, beaver facility as well. So wow. that we'll be taking in beavers to, mm. to work with. Um, there's an awful lot to do in Devon. We're going to be doing some enclosure refurbishments as well. We're doing, mm -hmm. um, we're doing quite a lot with a wolf enclosure up there as well. Really? Just okay. to more segregation um and yeah we just got lots of plans going on all any given time yeah um, but yeah they're going to be the main projects the, the reindeer project is going to be quite a big one and that's going to take mm. up a lot of the, the the time for the devon team. yeah and just a reminder for anyone who who doesn't know about uh, the wildwood memberships if you're a member at wildwood kent you're also automatically get a membership at wildwood devon you get unlimited visits to to both parks so which is incredible value i can't yeah can't say how amazing value that is um I wanted to talk a little bit about conservation and education. Um, how do you see the role of zoos kind of evolving? Because obviously education is one of the biggest parts of how conservation can work is, is yeah, you know, teaching, teaching the youngsters. How do you see that kind of 
the importance of that and how that evolves you know over the years is it's critically important and i think the, the, the word zoo means is, is a very broad term mm. from um from your really large big players like chess yeah. and zsl to to collections like us that, that we punch so far above our weight in terms of the conservation yeah. work that we do of course. Um, down to other collections that, that are more of a menagerie perhaps the, the more historical collections that mm -hmm. people can come to see the animals uh, solely and, and have less of a conservation output for me look, working in the zoological industry as long as I have I've, I've seen that evolve rapidly and it has to you know yeah, there is course. no question that the role of a zoological organization has to be focused mm. on, on conservation. And in order to do that, as you quite rightly point out, the educational elements to that are absolutely significant from public engagement, stakeholder engagement. You can't achieve anything mm. without without backing from the public, from, from landowners, from yep. anyone that you wish to work with and achieve you know, I mean, the Chuff Project's a, a really good example of that. Mm. Um, the public engagement that went out for that, having birds at Dover Castle, which the team put yeah. up the, the aviary there. Mm -hmm. um, and your education outputs, it, they are part of our mission. It's Zoos are licensed to carry out conservation projects. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are licensed to have an educational output. And I think mm. here at Wildwood, those elements, we, as every zoo licensing inspector that's ever been here has said, we, we fly on, on those elements. We, mm. we do incredibly well, you know, even, even down to having this incredible apiary. You know, we've got these incredible beehives, reared probably one of the biggest, biggest apiaries in, in any zoo in the UK mm. um, because pollinators are so critically important. Absolutely. And we, they tell this amazing story, but we, we, we plant out trees around the park we everything that we're doing is native species and native yep. species recovery not just within the the, the the animal collections themselves but we worked very hard two years ago now to create this incredible plantation of native species uh, of trees in our top forest area um, that were formerly hosting um, western hemlock trees which are non-native mm -hmm. most of those have been killed off by by bison getting to them <laughs> and we created this incredible plantation of native species and now when you go up there you go up there in spring or summer it's full of harvest mice which have wow. naturally migrated into the park we found convolvulus hawk moths there's a plethora of butterfly species up there wow. uh, grass snakes common lizards <laughs> slow worms common toads we we do so well just in our native species habitat and one of the things that, that particularly other zoological organizations really comment on when they come here is looking at our public barriers we use dead hedging quite a lot yeah um which is very unusual mm. but it creates this incredible habitat for the native species that that reside naturally in this mm -hmm. kind of habitat um and then we educate people on that we, we give mm -hmm. presentations the education team um works so hard on all of the interpretation that we put out of mm -hmm. course telling the story not just of, of the animals that we release back into the wild the animals that we nurture within this site as well and and that is absolutely critical not mm. zoological collections have to do more mm. they, they, they have to absolutely we, you know we are conservation focused they're not just words that that has to be put in, put into action people want to see it people mm. get behind it and it's it's why we're here yeah and one of the things i was going to say is well, what we chatted with with laura in the first episode was how quickly these changes happen as well yeah. um you know one once you introduce like a, a new species or you know and, and look into conservation and rewilding when you just sort of hand it over back to nature things just seem to happen like and you just sort of you can step back almost well, a little you, bit, yeah. that's absolutely right because nature knows what nature needs is is what, what i would say is, is that you, you can step back you you sometimes need to give things a head start you absolutely. need to give everything a helping hand but quite often less less can be more and just mm. stopping your intervention once things are going well and let, letting nature take over and do its job is is so important it's exactly what we do in the park where mm. where we plant areas up we leave them we let let nature then do the rest and of course we then see this migration of incredible species that we've not had in the park before mm -hmm. and and it, it just thrives brilliant and and how how much are all of the um, so you, I know that you're a part of Biaza and yeah. you know and the wilderness is part of Biaza as well. And how, how much are the how much do you talk to all the different zoos? Like, what's that community like? Is everyone chatting constantly? Like, is, there must be a lot of back and forth between different. There, absolutely, there, there there really is, and of course, everyone's sharing similar goals. And particularly where you're working with specific breeding programs, as you'll know, we've we've always had bison at the park. Mm -hmm. Part of the EP, we've got two young bison actually joining us 
fairly wow. seen from Highlands Wildlife. I should have mentioned that. Yeah, yeah, I think that might be an exclusive. Yeah, quite, can you, can you yeah, say that a little bit yeah, more about that? That's yeah, so we've got, we've got it, it, as many of our members and, and frequent visitors will know, we, we lost our two very elderly bison yeah. um, uh, last year, uh, which wasn't unexpected. No. Um, and we, we, you know, we're monitoring them and, and, and giving them the best that we can in their latter years. But of course, we can't be without bison as well. And as sad mm -hmm. as, as that was, we're very proud of the work that we did with Orsk and Hades. Yeah. Um, but we've got two youngsters coming and joining us from Highlands Wildlife Park. Wow. They're two young bulls. They're um, about 17 months old at the moment. Wow, and we're, Yeah, they're only youngsters, but they, they put on size very quickly. So, <laughs> I can imagine. Um, yeah, to, to someone who hasn't seen a full adult male bison, they'll, look, they'll still look pretty big. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're hoping to, to get those moved in fairly quickly with, within the next month is, is wow. our aspiration. So we're Incredible. working very closely with Highlands Wildlife Park, our zoological registrar, Judy's working all of the move forms licensing our veterinary team are currently working on all of the testing requirements because of course moving moving animals in mm -hmm. requires a lot of that so in terms of any animal move there's an awful lot of collaboration with other zoological collections um, i'm as you know a, a, a trustee for the british and irish uh, association of zoos and aquaria biaza um, so i i'm regularly in touch anyway with with other trustees with other mm -hmm. collections but I, I can honestly say i don't think a day goes by in my working day where i'm not in contact on the phone, via email, on Zoom, with another zoological collection, either in the UK or Europe. I don't think I don't think wow. I've ever had a day where that doesn't happen. <laughs> Fantastic, and um, obviously this, you know, transcends up to to, to politics as well. Yep. I mean, I mean, what can what can we be doing as um, sort of the average Joe to to, to help uh, the cause of conservation and rewilding in, in terms of like lobbying and that kind of thing? Like, what can we do? I think as much as anything is is. Yeah people need to show show that they're really interested in it and sure. get behind it visiting places like the wildwood or other other animal based attractions that mm. are doing this phenomenal work showing their support and then when we have political uh, discussions or there's there's stumbling blocks that, that, that may appear as they do from time to time you know it, it's no secret we struggled um, the sector struggled a lot um, on the aftermath of Brexit, yeah. you know, mainly in terms of animal movements because the, the, the legislation and avenues to, to move animals between the European Zoo Association and the UK, mm -hmm. Europe and the UK, um, it's always been really easy and now of course it's not it must it's have been so much admin added on top i mean you've already got a hard enough job i mean to then yeah. it must have been really difficult it is and it's, it's navigating a landscape that nobody in, including government officials um fully understood because the that those mechanisms what what we'd always use to transfer we were part of the european union sign a piece of paper get an animal over and of course that doesn't yeah. exist anymore so wow. so where where uh, and it's something that the the Biaza had lobbied and worked very, very hard against trying to, to change with DEFRA and with, with government officials. Of course, that, that's really challenging. And it's, we're still not seeing the end of that yet. So, wow. so there's always, you know, politics get, get, yeah. can get in the way of conservation <coughs> um, in terms of, of licensing to, to, to release specific species. You know, there's, there's often delays. And, but we always want to do the right thing. We want to do things properly. Um, so monitoring and, and fecal screening and, and all of these things that we do before we release animals into the wild, we do it all properly, but sometimes mm. things can, can take longer than perhaps necessary. Yeah, fair. Well, I know, Mark, you're an incredibly busy man, <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll try not to take up too much of your time, but we do have one final thing we'd like to do. <laughs> we have asked our members to um, write in a couple of questions, oh, great. and I would like you to pick a couple of questions sure. that I will read out to you, if that's okay. Go on then. So I've got um, <laughs> our magic, uh, still not sponsored um, uh, tray. So we, that'll be sponsored soon, hopefully. I don't know why I'm picking one. You can uh, pick one if no, you no, want. No, no, please, you, uh, yeah. you pick one so it's random and then I'll read it out. So yeah, sure. Let's have a little look. <laughs> if animals could talk, which species do you think you would be the most, sorry, which species do you think would be the most interesting to have a conversation with? <laughs> what a good question. That's great. <laughs> Crumbs, okay. Um, what would be the most interesting? I, I, can I, I can I use two here? Yeah, I, go for I it. would love to hear the conversation that our bull elk Jürgen has been having with Bocky the young bear because <laughs> there's been a lot of interaction through, between those two enclosures with, with Bocky shaking trees at him, uh, Jürgen, uh, if he could frown, frowning at him and then uh, rubbing his antlers up against the tree opposite him. And I'm wondering what on earth they're actually doing. What's they're that just, conversation going to be? I want to know what that conversation is because Bocky's clearly loving it. <laughs> <laughs> 
he's, <laughs> he, he's finding it quite, quite, quite amusing to, to potentially wind Jurgen up. Jurgen, on the other hand, doesn't look like he's enjoying it as much and, <laughs> and wants to tell him off. So Cheek. I'd be very interested. I'd be very, very interested in hearing that conversation. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. So Bucky's got under Jurgen's skin just a tad. Little, yeah, yeah. Not so much now, but certainly, uh, yeah, certainly <laughs> during the breeding season of elk. Yeah, oh. it was, yeah that, that would have been great to hear. Brilliant. And one more. Oh, okay. This let's looks go. like a long one. It's a long one. Okay, let's do this one. Let's do this one. Uh, hands are getting a bit cold now. <laughs> okay. If you could be any animal for a day, which one would you be and why? Wow. Well, that's a very, you took a long oh, pause there. Long <laughs> well, the, the lazy answer to that would be a brown bear in torpor because I could just sleep all day. Wouldn't that be wonderful? What a wonderful thing that Is would that be. Is that just based on your schedule? Though? That's like, based <laughs> on my schedule and based on right now. Um, <laughs> have a little snooze. No, I, gosh, that, that's another really good question. I think it would probably have to be one of our display birds. I think perhaps a barn owl. I think that'd be wonderful. Owl. Yeah, just, just to be able to get that sense of what it's like to have such incredible hearing and incredible eyesight mm. and be able to manoeuvre around in these incredible displays that the, the, the team put on here. I think that would be a really nice, nice, I think nice experience answer. for a day, wouldn't it? Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Mark. It's my pleasure. And yeah, I'm sure we'll see you again in future episodes. And thank you for your time. It. Pleasure. Thanks, Cheers. Mike. Thank you very much. So that was Mark Haben. Mark is our Director of Zoological Operations here at the Wildwood Trust, doing an amazing job looking after the animals, managing our keeper and ranger teams. Thank you for the donations that you've made every time you visit Wildwood. Every penny that you spend goes directly to looking after, caring for the animals here at Wildwood and also developing our native species conservation projects. We do not receive any funding from the government. Um, we are totally dependent on the money that you bring when you visit our parks and you become a member of Wildwood, so thank you. So we've got some amazing projects coming up this year. Keep an eye on social media and our website. If you do want to get more involved, if you'd like to donate, go to our website. All of the information is there. Um, keep an eye on our podcast as well. Thank you. <laughs>